Amen. God bless you. It is a children's church. You guys could take off if you need to head down to children's church. The rest of us, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to John chapter 13. Turn to John chapter 13. <clears throat> we just finished a series uh, going through and looking at all of the apostles. I hope you enjoyed it. They're online if you'd like to skip ahead and look at your favorite apostle or least favorite and take a look at a little bit about them, you can do it. But on this weekend, a holiday weekend, and before we start, I think a fun series going through Joshua, we're going to look at the apostles as many of us have seen them before as painted in probably the most famous rendering ever of the Last Supper and talk a little detail in it but it's specifically based on John chapter 13, verse 21. So if you have that as a, uh, in your Bible or on your phone, you're going to want to look at that passage because it's represented in this painting. Um, as recently as the Olympics, we saw the Last Supper portrayed in front of the world in a heretical way, but it's not that new. It's everything from uh, Peanuts characters, <clears throat> excuse me, the Smurfs, uh, about any uh, Star Wars. You could do, you could name any group of people. They've been likely characterized in the famous Last Supper. That probably is, uh, is something they have all attempted to do. But what we see in it is it is a frozen moment in time. All that old Catholic painting and cathedral, they were attempting to teach us things because most were illiterate and they didn't have a copy of the Bible. And so it needed to be done visually. And that's why when you tour these wonderful places in Italy, it's so over the top gorgeous. It's trying to re represent Bible and text to you who at the time was unable to read it yourself. That was absolutely the case with this probably most famous painting of all time. His Mona Lisa is valued at $870 million. This is priceless. Literally don't know because it's never been sold. It's 29 feet long and 15 feet high. It was painted in a monastery, so it's never moved. But I thought kind of funny if you notice the center, because that's what it looks like today. The center, they decided 150 years after it was painted. Now note it's painted in the late 1400s, completed in 1498. 150 years later, somebody said, well, you know, the flow of our monks, it sure would be nice if there could be a door in that wall. So that's what they did. They cut out a door in the wall and lost the bottom part of the, like Jesus' feet under the table, and so that was cut out. But a lot of the detail that they have today on this is because many of his students took that painting when it was freshly done and repainted it and repainted it and repainted it. So there's many, many renditions of this, and you'll look close and you'll see that it's a little different. Well, it's because it's not it. That's it. And if you see a great rendering, it probably is the fact that it's not actually his rendering because this would be a very common rendering. And if you have it in your, um, you have a little copy in your bulletin. So think for just a minute. This is the passage. It is literally verse uh, chapters 13 to 17 in John. That's the upper room story. This is where Jesus, it's an intimate moment with him and his 12. 13 to 17, these chapters, the discourse in that room took place. But 1321, read that if you have your Bible, 
After saying these things, it was Jesus washing their feet and the exchange of all that took place with that. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Freeze. That's it. This is it. You say, oh, because you read the text. and No, it's because he left hundreds of pages of commentary on his stuff. He only has 13 paintings. Did you know that? Michelangelo has hundreds. Raphael, hundreds. All the Ninja Turtles had, right? All the Ninja Turtles had hundreds of paintings, but not him. He had 13. That was it. And then he wrote about a lot of it. So it's not reading into the painting. It's actually things that he has described that he was putting in the painting. And it's frozen from this text. They're having the Last Supper meal together. His, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So the tension of that moment the tension that's in each of our lives because of some struggle or some decision that you need to make. This painting actually gives us the calm, the message that's necessary to get through the betrayal, the abandonment, the pain, the uncertainty. All that you're experiencing, it's in the painting, it's in the text. So as we look at this, we're going to look at three things. The first one is the painting itself. If you have your notes, you can take a look at your notes. There's 7,000 pages that he left as script to his, um, to his paintings. As a funny side note, and I don't think it's visible on the screen, it might be on your, um, it should be on your uh, bookmark. I don't have one. Can I see one? Yeah, let's just look at that. There's, uh, Vinci apparently means, yeah, and this one, you can only see it on the one side with all the labels of characters. And on the plain side, you can only see it on the left, uh, the corner of the tablecloth. Do you see on the left side? It's below Bartholomew on the far left. See the big knot? Do you guys see that there? It's just kind of interesting. All of his works have knots. And apparently Vinci, and I looked this up, I've looked it up in art books and they agree, but then I look in the language, the old language, it may not, that Vinci means to win, but it also means knot, K-N-O-T. So he is known for knots, like the Mona Lisa. Has anyone seen the Mona Lisa? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, some of you have. Um, around this frumpy little dress she's wearing, th around the collar, there's this intricate knotting of tapestry that's just gorgeous. So there's, like, places that print and make his knots because he was fascinated by it. He left pages of knots that would make great like doilies kind of thing or he just was he was really good at it and they like the Mona Lisa one is not found in anything anywhere of the day it was purely all his design and his making but I believe all of his 13 paintings have knots in them how about that for a worthless piece of trivia and on this it's only the corners of the table two beautiful knots in the corners of the table is about all they have there on this cleaner version, you can see things, and you know, you don't want to, uh, there are earlier paintings of the Last Supper where everyone's on one side of the table, right? Isn't that the big joke that everyone says? That he's, you know, uh, anyone that wants to be in the picture, get on the other side of the table. Earlier ones, Judas was the only one on this side to keep him separate. You may not notice it until I say it. He is separated here too. He is separated because he's the lowest of all of them. So visually, he's the lowest. 
And that was his way to separate among maybe a few other things that he did to especially point out, this is Judas, this one's different. Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Freeze the scene. On the far left, they're in groups of three. On the far left, it's Bartholomew, James the Less, and Andrew. You don't have to guess because he left that in his notes. <laughs> so you don't have to be like genius to figure these out. But it represents the emotions. The ones on the far left, they're, um, they're surprised. The other side, look at the ones on the far other side. Uh, these three, these three surprised, these three aren't even looking at Jesus. Those three are, verse 22, the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of who they spoke. They were looking at each other. The second group, this one here, you have John and you have Judas, and Judas was literally, he went to a prison and found the best face. So if you look at them all, you do see this one's a little, little rough. It's Peter. And if you look at these three, you look at Judas and what all he's doing. In fact, many don't notice, and they don't all have it, but Peter has a knife behind Judas, which shows a little bit, right? It's more than that. It's not only, it shows his temper. It showed later on he was going to uh, strike a guard. Um, great movement here, both hands, and then that salt shaker. Both of Judas's hands are active. One is reaching for bread. There's a passage. It's a fulfillment of Scripture. The one who eats my bread has turned against me. And so Judas is reaching for the bread. He's knocking over the salt, which is symbolic of bad luck. Group three, or the last group, these three... You can kind of guess who would have his finger. That's Thomas. I want to feel. And then, of course, you have James, and then that's Philip looking over. This is emotional. This is the only point on all of that is to say it was very emotional. There's lots going on in this passage because he just said, one of you is going to betray me. So try to feel some of the emotion that's taking place here. But then we look at, and it's finally, this, it's the last thing, is that we see the ever-presence of Jesus in the, in the painting itself. The number three is everywhere. When they're listed, the, uh, the four listings in the Bible of the apostles, each four have the same start name. So they're really in three groups of four. These are in four groups of three. Then you have the three famous windows in the background. Look at the triangle shape that Jesus is in. But then you look at John, which is sitting to his right. Look how him and John form their own triangle. This is what I think is most amazing, and we'll never look at this painting again without noting, is that Jesus is also in it three times. And you say, oh, now you're going to start reading into it. Oh, no, when we say it, and many of you may already know it, when you say it, you're like, oh, of course he is. There is this presence in the center of this text which is screaming of, you have tension in your life. There is a calmness to the person of Jesus Christ and faith in him. Come into a growing relationship with Jesus, and he brings a calm to you. In fact, you go through Jesus, the paintings in the back, the three windows are paradise. In fact, Mike, um, 
uh, Da Vinci actually put a nail in the center of the wall at Jesus so that all the lines went to him. Your eyes just naturally go to him. And if you look on this side, it's the, this side is the resemblance of Jesus on the cross. And even more than that, because that's James standing like holding back the other two. But funny, you got two characters right over his shoulder, which are the thieves. You have Thomas on the right, put his finger up. I don't believe unless I... And then you have the... So it's the scene at the cross. And then this one, John is always painted in a feminine way. He's always painted with soft features. And some have said, oh, it kind of looks like Mary. Oh, I think it does look like Mary. Look at, her pos look at his position. What position is that? Does that look familiar? That's Madonna with child. That, that's, that is Mary into John. So you have here a beautiful posture of John painted as Mary holding baby Jesus on this side, and then you have on this side Jesus' crucifixion, and Jesus himself forms a triangle, the three. Jesus is everywhere in the painting, and your eyes go to him, in the moment of tension, in the moment of all of your uncertainty and betrayal, in all of that, Jesus Christ is the center and he is calm. It's not a religion. It's not a set of beliefs, although there's a lot of religions that do good and denominations. There's a necessity to it, and we all have our statement of faith. But it, it all is down here because the main thing is the person of Jesus Christ. You and I, drawn into a relationship with God and Jesus Christ through faith in Him alone, that's it. So when you get the word that something has happened and there's a disaster, or to you it's a disaster, of, from loss of job to child to, um, we find our calm always in the same place. That's the message. So early, previous to da Vinci, all the apostles were painted with halos to show their sainthood. So you think back at museums you've been to and you see they all have the halo. He doesn't have any of that here because he's sending the message that they're common people like us. We struggle with the same betrayal. We struggle with the same pain. And the message is the same for all of us. The message is the person of Jesus Christ. And somehow we have to struggle with the fact that we acknowledge a faith in Jesus almost as a side. We live our life and we have our mission of work and family and we're trying to do good and even in the community and we've got good things going and we do have faith in Jesus and we go to church or we serve. No, it's the other way. The central piece is faith in Jesus Christ. You and I live for a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We spend time with Him to allow that relationship to change us, continually transform us as we face our, now we see all the things sticking in, family and work and crises. It's center. And I think that's our struggle. One sign that it's my life is my life and I want to just stick Jesus in when it's most convenient. One sign of that is it also produces I'm involved in church and I'm involved in my Bible reading and I have my faith in Jesus because it makes my life better. It just works better that way. And I just get, te and the things are really difficult if I don't spend time. So that's our motivation. 
That's the sign of which I'm living my life with Jesus stuck in. Instead, it's where, and this is true of you, I know it's true of you, where you say, no, 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 no. My faith in Jesus, if my life falls apart because of faith in Jesus, I'm having faith in Jesus. I'm not doing it for the benefits, although I love the benefits. I have faith in Jesus because he's my Lord and my Savior. He loves me. He brings a calm and a perspective to life that is kingdom-minded. I want to think like him. I want to act like him because he deserves it. And then I'll do what he asks me to do. Does he bring calm? Yeah, he does. He absolutely does. He brings clarity of thought in very uncertain times. And he brings a contentment when everything's falling apart. He does all of that. That's not why we follow him. We follow him because he's our God and Savior. He's earned it. We love him. There's a phrase that I have written at my desk. Let me just end with this. And I don't even know exactly where I got. I tried to Google it to find out where it is, and it's not out there. So if I wait another couple months, it'll be my phrase. I'm going to give people time to claim it. I think it was a devotional book I was reading or something. And it said, uh, bless be to Jesus. He can do it and he will do it. It's not like he will do it, meaning, hey, you need to do it. It's that statement of faith, blessed be him. He can do it. Oh, he will do it. You're struggling with something. It, the disease may not go away. I, I don't know that it will or it won't. I don't know that you get your job back or you may get a job that pays less than it is. I don't know how it is. I know that it's going to be best for glory to him and for you. I know that for sure. Blessed be to God. He can take care of this. And he will take care of this. In the middle of this scene of chaos and betrayal and emotions, in the middle of all of that, there he is in the center. Just in the center, now he's in more places than you even knew. Because he's got it. You're going to be sad for a while. It's going to hurt. The road, I don't want it. I would take it away from you if I could in a second. Honest, any of us would. We're sorry for the pain. However, he can be trusted. It's okay. He knows what's best. He will work through it. He can work through it. So let's bow in prayer. The quietness right now is just we're bowed heads. Is there an area of your life that's bringing a discomfort and uncertainty? You're, you're, it's bringing tension. You have anxiety over it. Would you give that to him right now? Just pause and say, Lord, I want that calm. I want your perspective. You've earned it. You're my Savior. So verbally give it to him, just between you and him, and say, I, I hate that this is happening, but I trust you. I hate that person's gone. God, I think about it all the time. I'm so upset about it, but I trust you. And Heavenly Father, I'm asking that you would bring that calm and rest to all of us as we celebrate each day the wonderful salvation that we have through, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.